Okay, cool. I think we should get started. We have a lot to cover today on a very exciting topic that's critically important. But for students who are taking the class uh, at ETH, uh, this is a topic that we cover, but I'm, I'm not planning to test you on it basically. And you can see it from the past exams also, but this is really for uh, your benefit. And it's really important to learn about timing and verification because in the end, uh, it turns out verification by itself is the most time consuming and uh, the most expensive process in designing a, a working computer, computing system. It's really all about verification. You spend a lot of time in design, yes, but in today's systems, uh, more than 60, 70% of the time is spent on verification and testing and making sure that uh, the thing really works. Uh, and if you include the testing that's done during the design stage, actually, that fraction is even higher uh, than 70, 80%. Okay, so that's the importance of this lecture, basically. And uh, I'm going to skip the required reading. So hopefully you know these, we discussed this yesterday. So next week, we're going to uh, go up one level. We're gonna start with the microarchitecture and ISA, actually. Actually, we're gonna start with the ISA, instruction set architecture first, talk about the von Neumann model and programming, and then we're going to jump into microarchitecture. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We're gonna go up in the stack. Uh, and you remember the required assignments, so I'm gonna skip those also. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, basically, I plan to wrap up uh, uh, finite state machines. Oh, wait a second. I, 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 hear, I hear myself. Okay. I had to close the YouTube window. Okay. Uh, basically, I'm going to wrap up FSMs and Verilog. This is going to take really short time because we really covered uh, essentially everything that you need to know to build finite state machines in hardware description language and Verilog. And then we're going to jump into timing and combinational circuits and then in sequential circuits. And then we're going to wrap up with a lot of discussion on circuit verification and also doing test benches in Verilog and how to test your circuits in Verilog. So that part is going to be important in your labs, for example, because you're all going to do labs and test your circuits. Okay, so let's do this wrap up quickly. I recall that we covered finite state machines in lecture six and a finite state machine consists of three parts. You have the next state logic that determines what is your next state. You have the state register that we talked about, a D flip-flop, for example, that uh, stores your state. And then you have the output logic also that determines what the outputs are. Essentially, you have the state register and you basically uh, update the next state in the state register using the next state logic. And essentially, this consists of both sequential uh, circuits and combinational circuits, uh, as you know already. Uh, sequential circuits is the state register and the combinational circuits is the next state logic and the output logic. We've, you've seen this before. And we've already seen how to do all of these in hardware description languages. So we're going to put things together in a little bit, but with one example, and I'm going to leave the other example for you. So the first example is something we're going to cover in timing a lot, basically clock. Uh, you already know about the clock. And there might be reasons why you may want to divide the clock frequency by three, for example, so that you operate uh, with a slower clock uh, uh, depending on your requirements. So th that's, this is what that means, basically. You have a clock that looks like this. And uh, why is the clock frequency clock divided by three? Essentially the output, at least in this case, uh, what, what does it mean to divide the clock by three? It means that the output Y is high for one clock cycle out of every three. In other words, the output divides the frequency of the clock by three essentially. And uh, basically uh, to be able to do that, uh, this is uh, how we uh, design the finite state machine basically. It's not uh, that difficult as you can see, you have three states, S0, S1, and S2, and in S0, uh, and in each state, you stay the same amount of time, clock. So clock transitions from state to state. But S0, uh, in S0, Y is equal to 1. In all other states, Y is equal to 0. OK, that's the idea. So you can see that the Y output is the output of the state machine. And the tra you transition on the clock edge, rising clock edge. And this is the finite state machine to be able to do that. For so we're going to uh, de define this. So you have an input clock. It's resettable. And then you have an output Q in this case. Uh, and we have a state and next state, as you can see, we have any two bits for that because we have three states. And then we use parameters to define the state so that it's more readable, S0, S1, S2, but these really correspond to state encodings as we discussed in lecture six. Uh, as I already said, the state and next state are two-bit register, regs, not registers, as we discussed last time. And the parameter descriptions are optional, but it makes reading easier. And this is your uh, state register, as you can see. So uh, basically state gets next state 
every positive edge of the clock. And then there's a reset signal that happens uh, that's basically resets the state to S0, as you can see over here. OK, now that's easy, as you can see. Uh, it's sensitive to only clock and reset. And reset is active when it's 1. And it's an asynchronous reset, if you remember from the last lecture. And next state logic is very easy also. Basically, uh, this happens at any input change, as we discussed last time. And you basically switch based on the, the state. Uh, if state is S0, next state is S1. If the current state is S1, next state is S2. And it's, if it's S2, next state is S0. And then there's a default case that may help you with debugging, for example, potentially. Right? OK. And then output logic is also very simple. Basically, uh, the output is 1 only if the state is equal to 0, as you can see over here. So basically, we created a very simple finite state machine in Verilog. Uh, uh, and in this case, uh, output depends on state. So it's a Moore type FSM, if you remember from lecture 6. So this is the entire finite state machine in Verilog, basically, that contains uh, the state register over here, the next state logic, and the output logic. So you can see that the output logic is very simple, depending on the state. OK, so basically, we're, we, we, uh, we, have, we know how to build finite state machines. But I mean, you knew that before. We just put everything together. Uh, uh, from the last lecture here. And I'm not going to cover this one. Uh, you remember the smiling snail from our lecture six also. Uh, we designed the finite state machine for this. In fact, we designed the Boolean equations for this. Uh, I'm not going to do that at this point. Uh, but essentially, you can also write it in Verilog. And I'll let you study it. It's very similar to what we have just discussed. It's not that uh, different, basically. And the entire finite state machine, this is a Mealy type finite state machine. But the entire finite state machine looks like this. But it's, again, very simple. Uh, you can see that the, even the uh, state transitions are very simple, because these are really simple finite state machines. Later on, uh, not next week, but the week after that, we're going to see the finite state machine of an entire microprocessor, the little computer 3D microprocessor. And you will see that that finite state machine is much bigger. And there's a lot more going on. And writing that in Verilog is going to consume more Verilog uh, code for you. OK, so this is basically what we learned in the last part of last uh, lecture. We described sequential circuits. We talked about the always statement. Uh, this is needed for defining memorizing elements like flip-flops and latches. But it can also be used to define combinational circuits. And sometimes it's much easier to define combinational circuits using always statements, as we have seen. But sometimes it's not a good idea to use always statements to uh, define, uh, describe, uh, easy to desc otherwise easy to describe combinational circuits. Uh, we talked about blocking and non-blocking statements. So hopefully you remember that. Uh, blocking, uh, 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 non-blocking. Uh, blocking, uh, uh, essentially, these, uh, these are useful for implementing uh, state transitions at the end of a block, right? That's, that's why you use these less than or equal to assignment uh, over here. That happens at the end of the block. OK, and then we, just, we talked about describing FSMs in Verilog uh, just now. Uh, so to put everything together. So now we're done with, essentially, uh, uh, hardware description languages. Of course, you will learn a lot more when you do the labs. And the best way of learning a hardware description language, or any language for that matter, is really by uh, doing practice and uh, writing code, uh, looking at code, uh, debugging code, and understanding how things work uh, through that practical approach. And that's why we have the labs in this class. OK, so that was the wrap up from last lecture. Now let's go into timing and verification, uh, which uh, I said is a fascinating topic. So this is what we will cover. We'll cover timing and combinational circuits, essentially short path and long path delays, uh, as well as propagation and contamination delays, which affect the short path and long path delays. We'll briefly talk about glitches, why they may matter, they may not matter. Then we'll talk about timing and sequential circuits, define setup time and hold time, and determine how fast a circuit can operate in sequential circuits. We'll talk about the sequencing overhead, for example, due to flip-flops and latching. And then uh, we will switch to circuit verification, uh, talk about different ways of making sure a circuit works correctly. And we'll talk about two different types of verification, functional and timing. And as I said, these are critically important because in the end, you need to uh, make sure your circuit works. And so far, we've assumed that uh, timing doesn't play into our decisions, but timing is essential. Uh, everything has a delay. Uh, and we need to take that into account. OK, let me give, give you the bigger picture to begin with. Basically, circuit design is really a trade-off between multiple different metrics. Area, clearly, we discussed, right? Circuit area is proportional to the cost of the device. And ideally, we would like to minimize the area. That's why we have the logic minimization techniques. Uh, 
speed and throughput. Ideally, we want faster, more capable circuits to solve the most difficult problems uh, relatively quickly, as we discussed in the first lecture. And power and energy, clearly, this is true in almost all aspects of computing, but especially in mobile devices, we have a very limited power supply and we have a limited battery. So we would like to minimize the energy and power consumption that uh, we have in our circuits. And high, even high performance devices are limited by the power uh, that you can supply to these very high performance devices and you have, uh, and they're, they're limited by cooling as well. And also you have a, a, the design time, which is important as we discussed uh, at the beginning of this lecture, clearly design, I, I should call this design and verification time. Designers and verifiers are expensive in terms of time and many. And if you are too late in designing and verifying and putting out your circuit to market, the competition may already, may already have surpassed you. So this is really important as well. So all of your efforts would be useless if you're not fast enough, quick enough, basically. And requirements and goals clearly depend on the application. And there are many, many applications. But if you're good at all of these, clearly you're very competitive, even if your application is very specific uh, to something. right? OK. So we'll talk about circuit timing. Until now, we talked about the functionality of circuits, right? In fact, some of you asked questions in the last lecture related to timing. As, uh, and I said that, uh, let's, uh, let's defer that until later, which is today. Uh, so basically, so far, we concerned ourselves with the logical functionality. But timing is also a critical component of a circuit. How fast uh, is the circuit? How fast can we get the output after we apply the inputs? That's what this means, basically. How can we make it faster? if it's possible. And what happens if we run a circuit too fast? Will we get errors uh, or will we run into other issues uh, like uh, maybe burning down the circuit, right? Uh, so a design that is logically correct can still fail because of real world implementation issues like this and timing is one of them basically. So in the first part of this lecture, we're gonna talk about combinational circuits, combinational logic timing essentially. And uh, we're gonna break this abstraction. Digital logic we have is a convenient abstraction. And so far we've, uh, considered it as the output changing immediately with the input changing, right? So we have this inverter uh, that has an uh, output Y, input A, and we assume that the output Y changes immediately uh, after A changes. So clearly this is not real. This is not correct. This is just an abstraction. It's also called a functional or logical abstraction. Uh, but in real life, you have a delay uh, between the output and the input. So after you apply the input, there's some time it takes for the inputs to propagate over the wires, plus go through this inverter that I showed you earlier. And transistors take a finite amount of time to switch. And this is uh, the example. Ignore the wire delays for now over here. This is the inverter delay uh, that we see over here. And clearly there's some time difference uh, until uh, when the output Y becomes stable or uh, let's say large enough, uh, logical one, let's say. Uh, and that's the delay of this inverter. Uh, if you will. And there are different definitions of the delay potentially, right? If you go into the analog part, you can say basically uh, the 50% uh, point uh, of the, v, let's say, voltage. Uh, uh, when, do, when do you get to the 50% point? That could be a delay, but it could be from the 10% uh, point over here to 90% point over here also in the analog uh, range of the uh, voltage that you apply to the circuit. You don't need to worry about that at this point. You just need to worry about that uh, there's a specified delay and the delay is specified as a maximum delay. There is a maximum delay of this inverter and there's also a minimum delay of this inverter. And we will see why both of them are important. Okay, so this is an example from a scientific paper that talks about, that basically uh, simulates an inverter and shows a real delay example. So here, for example, the 90% high input uh, leads to a 10% low over here. And the delay is, as you can see, 0 0.175 nanoseconds. So there's some, after the input is applied, you get a delay. Uh, after the input is applied here, you also get a delay over here, as you can see. And this is the 50% to 50% to 50 delay, as I mentioned. And this is the 90% to 10% delay, as I mentioned over here. And you can define different delays. We're not going to talk about that. But this is real, basically. In circuits, you have delays. Uh, so, okay, let's talk about this delay a little bit more. So this is fundamental. It's really caused by the capacitance and the resistance in a circuit. Uh, and also the finite speed of light. Basically, you cannot uh, move things, move the electrons uh, or the holes uh, faster than the speed of light, essentially. So wires have delay as well. So anything affecting these quantities can also change the delay. For example, the rising 
edges or the falling edges of the inputs. Uh, that's that's certainly possible. Uh, that that have uh, that that have an effect on the delay, whether you're on the rising input or the falling input. So rising means uh, we've already discussed this, but let me go back here. So here A is rising, right, going from zero to one, and Y is uh, uh, rising over here also. Okay, uh, and different inputs have different delays also because they have, they may have different paths. Uh, changes in environments like temperature may actually lead to delays, as we will also discuss. And aging of the circuit may actually change the structure of the circuit and may actually change the delays in the circuit. So they're clear there's a lot of effects going on. As, as you have used your computer tw for 20 years or 30 years, uh, that may become slower also potentially because of the uh, delays, uh, because of the circuit level, device level structural changes, which we're not going to talk about in this lecture clearly. Uh, but we're going to talk abstract. Basically, we have a range of possible delays from input to output. We're going to abstract everything as a minimum delay of the circuit and a maximum delay of the circuit. Okay. So for this, let's let's define some uh, let's uh, at least combinational uh, delay uh, terminology. So we're going to look at the delays from an input uh, input to output. An output will be labeled as Y. So contamination delay, TCD, is the delay until output starts changing. And propagation delay is the delay until output is stable, basically, finishes changing. So you can think of contamination delay as the shortest possible delay and propagation delay as the longest possible delay uh, for a given uh, circuit, let's say. So let's take a look at this combinational circuit. It has two inputs, A, B, and an output Y. It's combination logic, as you can see over here. So if you ch change input A, uh, so it could be going from zero to one or one to zero. That's what the signal over here means. Uh, there is a point when Y starts changing. Uh, y starts basically uh, changing. And that distance in time from A changing and Y starting changing is called the contamination delay. And that's the shortest possible delay. Basically, that means that at this point, your Y may change. Okay, let's take a look at the propagation delay. After A starts changing, after A starts changing, uh, Y becomes stable after some point. So that's the longest possible delay needed for Y to become stable at the end of this combination logic. That's called the propagation delay. So these are important because this is the longest possible delay and contamination delay is the shortest possible delay in the circuit. So you may wonder, why do I care about the shortest possible delay? It will become clear later on. Uh, don't worry about it now. But clearly, longest possible delay you care about, right? Because if it's too long, then uh, uh, you, you may have problems in your speed of your circuit, right? Uh, you may not get your output in the amount of time that you really want to get your output in. But shortest possible delay also has an importance, as we will see in a little bit. OK, cross-hatching value, uh, cross-hatching in this uh, here means the value is changing. In a sense, the, the value is not stable yet. So metastability is part of the cross-hatching. but uh, we don't have a stable output uh, over there. OK, so we're going to calculate longest and shortest delay paths in combination logic. And we care about both of them, as I said. And we will see why about the shortest path later. Longest path is hopefully intuitive, uh, but maybe not in, not in the same way as I will describe it later when we come to sequential logic. So when we come to sequential logic, uh, all of these paths will become even more clear. OK. But this is an illustration of a circuit with four inputs and one output, as you can see, two AND gates and one OR gate. And you can see there's a short path over here, uh, which goes through only one gate. D input goes through only one gate to affect the output. Uh, and there's a critical path, which is the longest path, uh, which goes through one, two, three gates. Right. In this case, we can consider that the critical path because you really exercise all three gates uh, for A and B to affect uh, output Y. OK, so let's take a look at the delays uh, in terms of the gate delay. So propagation delay, which is the longest path through this combination logic, is two propagation delays of the end gates. Because we have two end gates, we multiply the propagation delay of an end gate by two. They're the same end gate. Plus, and add to it the propagation delay of the OR gate. So hopefully this is trivial, right? You basically add up the delays of uh, the uh, gates that are uh, on the critical path, essentially. Shortest path. Again, what is the shortest path here? It's, it goes from input D to output Y through this gate. And there's only one gate. That's the AND gate. So we take the contamination delay, minimum delay of this AND gate. So the minimum delay through the circuit is uh, the contamination delay, or minimum delay of the circuit is the contamination delay of the only the AND gate. OK, so hopefully that's clear. 
And this is from your book. Uh, basically, this shows how things propagate. So if you, for example, change A from one to zero, it takes time for N1 to change, as you can see over here. And then after N1 changes, it takes time for N2 to change. And then after N2 changes, it takes time for Y to change. That's why you get two AND gate delays plus one OR gate delay. Hopefully that's obvious. Uh, note that not all changes in the input affect the output. In, uh, in this case, we constructed the input such that uh, going from one to zero actually changes the output from one to zero. But some, uh, sometimes actually it may not, right? So if this were a one, if C was a one, for example, going from one to zero would not matter at all, right? Because output will not change, okay? So keep that in mind. So to be able to really exercise the worst case delays, you really need to exercise the worst case uh, inputs. Okay, and the shortest path, which is the best case delay uh, in this case is really when D changes, as you can see from one to zero here and Y also changes from one to zero. So it basically takes this AND gate uh, to change. And it's really the minimum delay of that AND gate, which is the contamination delay. So we're not going to go into how we calculate the delay for every single gate that's below the abstraction level of this course. So again, if you're really interested in that, it's fascinating also, you should really take a microelectronics design course or semiconductor devices course, for example, that talks about how to calculate de delays of these different transistors uh, and also uh, gates built uh, from transistors. Uh, but uh, we're gonna assume that these propagation delays and uh, contamination delays are given to us from a cell library, for example, right? Uh, and that's our assumption. We're gonna use that abstraction to calculate our uh, circuit delays. Okay, so, and uh, how is it given to us? Basically, they're given to us based on specification. So this is one specification. Uh, this is, again, TTL transistor to transistor logic. As you can see, this is all type of things that you put on your breadboards, for example, to do design. Uh, but this is no different from a cell level library, except you can visualize this one. You can see that this has four uh, two input NAND gates, which is a NAND two gate. And basically the specification of this part uh, says the typical delay at 25 degrees Celsius is this much, right? At uh, some voltage, the highest voltage, at least the lowest delay as we discussed earlier. Uh, when we talk about power also, you can see that the typical delay is, uh, uh, I think it's seven in terms of uh, nanoseconds, I believe it doesn't say over here, but it needs to be said somewhere clearly. Uh, but the max delay, as you can see over here is 135 nanoseconds. So basically, typically you get this propagation and contamination delays. In this case, contamination delay is not provided. Perhaps it's zero, I don't know. Uh, you have to look at other parts. Uh, oh, well, it's not, this is just a propagation delay, as you can see. Contamination delay, you need to look at some other row. Sorry about that. But you can see that even the propagation delay uh, has a minimum and maximum, okay? So there's heavy dependence on voltage and temperature. So depending on at what voltage and temperature you're running your circuit, you really need to make sure your circuit works, right? And there's a huge dependence over here, as you can see, seven to 135. But basically someone specifies these propagation delays and uh, contamination delays for us. Hopefully they optimize the circuit. Okay, so let's take a look at an example worst case propagation delay, which is uh, the worst case delay critical path of a circuit. And we're gonna look at the a four to one multiplexer that we discussed multiple times in the past lectures. And we're gonna look at two different implementations, actually three different implementations of it, but I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna discuss the third implementation as much, and that's going to be the best one. But let's take a look at two different uh, implementations of it first. So let's assume that uh, we're using a library with these gate delays. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but uh, a lot of these make sense. So four input or is, for example, 90 picoseconds, uh, 30 input not is, uh, well, no, uh, 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 an inverter is essentially 30 picoseconds, which makes sense, hopefully. And then you can see that we're gonna use also tri-states in some of the designs. So this is the first implementation that does not use tri-state buffers. You can see this is a four to one multiplexer that uh, we constructed before. It's used, uh, it's, it's, it's designed using uh, two level logic, uh, which is AND gates followed by an OR of the output of the AND gates. And you can see that, uh, uh, some of the output inputs are inverted to some of the gates as they should be, right? So if you're selecting D0, for example, uh, both of these should be zero uh, and they're connected that way. So let's take a look at the propagation delay, uh, the critical path delay uh, of this uh, implementation of the four to one multiplex. So there are two things we need to look at over here. One is the propagation delay from the select signal to output. Output is always considered Y. That's why this is select to Y over here. And uh, the other is the uh, uh, propagation delay from the data signal to the output, 
So we want to calculate both because there could be two possible paths that could be critical in this case. One is from the select signals, one is from the data signals to the output. Let's take a look at the uh, propagation delay from the select to output. Basically, select signal, and both of them are actually the same in this case uh, in terms of the gate delays they induce. Let's take a look at S1, for example, but S2 is essentially the same. S1 goes to one inverter, and then one three input AND gate, and then one four input OR gate. So basically, the propagation delay from select to Y is the propagation delay of a single inverter, one three input AND gate, and one four input OR gate, which means that you basically look up these 30, 80, and 90, and sum them up. That's 200 picoseconds. OK. And the second is, as you can see, uh, propagation delay from D to Y. Again, all of the Ds go through the same delays, same gates. So let's pick one. Uh, from D0, for example, you go through one three input AND gate and one four input OR gate. So that's strictly less than the propagation delay from select to Y, as you can see, as expected also. Uh, so basically, that's 170 picoseconds. So really, the propagation delay, overall propagation delay of this, uh, uh, the worst case delay, uh, of this multiplexer is 200 picoseconds. OK, let's take a look at a different implementation that uh, uses some AND gates and some uh, tri-state buffers. Essentially, AND gates are used to drive the select signals or enable signals of the tri-state buffers, as we discussed. So somebody, uh, somebody asked, wouldn't we have to consider wire delay? Absolutely. You need to consider the wire delay also. Uh, in all this I'm doing, the assumption is that wire delay is zero. But in real life, you may need to consider it. Certainly. So that's a very good question. Very, we're going to ignore the wire delays in this lecture, but the, uh, the, the, the issue is actually more complicated, as you, uh, as you mentioned. OK, so let's take a look at the second implementation. In the second implementation, as I said, uh, we're going to select uh, the, we're, we're going to uh, use tri state buffers. And the enable signals of the tri state buffers will be essentially the outputs of the AND gates, which are de determined by the select signals over here. So again, there are two paths one is select to output. And the other is data to output. And clearly, data to output is going to be small in this case. So let's cal calculate the data to output first. Basically, it, in order to go from any data input value to output value, you go through only one gate, which is really uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, tri-state buffer, right? And that's the propagation delay of that is only, uh, well, there, there are two, uh, two specifications you can see for the tri-state buffer, data to Y and then able to Y. We're exercising data to Y, which is 50 over here. So, the worst case delay from data input to output is 50 picoseconds. But the worst case delay from select input to output is one inverter, as you can see, one two input AND gate, and then one uh, tri-state buffer uh, uh, from the enable signal to the output. And that gives us one inverter delay, 30 picoseconds, plus one two input AND gate, 60 picoseconds, and one uh, tri-state buffer from enable to output, which is 35 picoseconds. That's 125 picoseconds. You can see that this design has a worst case propagation delay of 125 picoseconds, which is much better than the 200 picoseconds on the design over here on the left. Because we've eliminated the uh, large gates, if you will, right? We don't have a huge, well, four input OR. We don't have three input ends over here. We basically replace them with tri-state buffers. And uh, as you can see uh, over here, uh, the two input AND gates. And again, we're not taking into account wire delay. If you actually take into account wire delay, the loading may be higher in some of these. But again, we're not going to deal with that at this point. Uh, but still, 125 is much lower than 200 picoseconds, as you can see. OK, so this basically clearly shows you that two different uh, uh, logic level implementations of the same functional circuit, uh, same Boolean equation, let's say, gives you completely different delays. OK, and we already said that. And again, the worst case delay, you need to take the worst propagation delay. Worst case propagation delay, which is 200 picoseconds in this case and 125 picoseconds in this case. OK, so this is a third 4 to 1 MUX implementation. And this is actually better than either of those, as you can see. And this is completely based on tri state buffers. As you can see, this is a 2 to 1 MUX, this is a 2 to 1 MUX, and this is another 2 to 1 MUX. And each of them is essentially the same. Uh, and each of them is based on tri state buffers, which we have seen in the past also. Uh, and uh, if you do the calculation over here, basically, uh, the uh, select to Y delay, select 0 to Y delay, is really 85 nanoseconds. And uh, any data to Y delay is uh, 100 uh, nanoseconds. And as a result, uh, uh, this is actually faster, if you will. OK, this is nanoseconds and the, well, there's picoseconds because I actually copied it from uh, 
uh, a different edition of the book over here. So you can imagine that these are also picoseconds, right? It's, uh, otherwise, the rest is the same. OK, so you can see now the third implementation is even better, right? OK, so let's talk about calculating long and short paths. It's actually not always this easy to determine the long and short paths. I made it a bit easy. Uh, not all input transitions affect the output. You can have multiple different paths from an input to output. We kind of have two paths over here. But what if you imagine, uh, imagine having a more complicated combination logic that has 100 different possible paths or 1,000 different possible paths from input to output? These are usually large circuits, clearly. Now, it may not be easy to figure out what is the longest path and what is the shortest path in this case. Uh, and circuits are also not built, are not all built equally. Different instances of the same gates may have different delays, especially after you manufacture them. They're subject to manufacturing variation. Wires also have non-zero delay, which increases with length and loading on the wire. And temperature and voltage affect circuit speeds, as we discussed earlier. Not all circuit elements are affected the same way. This can even change the critical path uh, of a circuit. So if, imagine you have a 1,000 different potential critical paths in a combination logic. And uh, when you change the temperature, different gates and different paths get affected very differently from each other. And even though at 25 degrees Celsius, one path may be the uh, longest path, at 85 degrees Celsius, some other path may be the longest path. So now you have a dilemma, basically, right? Which one is your longest path? How do you determine your longest delay? Do you really take the worst case into account, which is operating at, let's say, 125 degrees Celsius, the circuit, uh, and operating at uh, uh, the highest level of manufacturing variation? Those, those tend to be usually very, very conservative. So uh, this is actually not easy to determine the long and short paths. All of them, all of them have solutions and trade-offs, but we're not going to go into how to solve those issues. Uh, you may actually... Uh, clearly, at, at different levels of temperature, you may, you may actually run at different frequencies, right, uh, a circuit. You may say, OK, at 125 degrees Celsius, my delays uh, are uh, very long in some of these paths. As a result, I cannot run the circuit at very high frequency, as we will discuss in a little bit. So I'm going to uh, use a much lower clock frequency for my chip. At 25 degrees Celsius, on the other end, my delays are relatively short, and I know the critical path is this so I can run the circuit at a much higher frequency. OK, so we will see that in a little bit when we talk about sequential logic. But I wanted to inject this right now because temperature may really affect your clock frequency at which you run the circuit. And you, that's, that's one way of solving the problem, right? Otherwise, you always run your circuit at the worst possible delay, right? Which is at the highest possible temperatures delay. Uh, but that may not be a good idea if, you're, if, if most of the time you're running uh, your processor at 20 degrees Celsius, right? OK. Uh, so designers usually assume worst case conditions and run many statistical simulations to balance yield and performance. So this is actually uh, a lot of uh, art and simulation and statistical simulation. Uh, so I'm not going to go into exactly how these paths are determined. But what I showed you is a good uh, back of the envelope calculation of these paths. And then you can, you can also add some margin saying that, OK, the rest will take uh, this amount of time based on my measurements. And then you add that margin on top of the delay. For example, that way you can take into account uh, the wire delays that you have in the circuit. OK, so let me summarize the combinational timing. Circuit outputs change sometime after the inputs change. This is caused by finite speed of light. Uh, and delays depend on inputs, environmental state, voltage, temperature, et cetera. And we discussed two, uh, pos uh, two uh, notions of delay. Contamination delay uh, leads to minimum possible delay from output to uh, input to output. And propagation delay leads to maximum possible delay from input to output. And delays change with many different things like circuit design, operating conditions, and manufacturing variation as well. Let me quickly talk about output glitches. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one because uh, when we see the sequential uh, timing later on, this may not matter. In general, output glitches don't matter. It's good to be aware of them, though, as a designer, because when you see some output changing for a very brief amount of time, uh, you would like to know why that is. And you would also like to make sure that that's not a problem, right? Uh, so from that, from, uh, if you design your circuit uh, nicely, these glitches should not matter. Only time they may matter is if you don't design your circuit nicely, uh, or you actually push your clock frequency very, very high. Uh, uh, and as a result, you may actually capture something that is glitching. OK, so what's a glitch? Basically, uh, glitches, one input transition causes multiple output transitions. So let's take a look at the circuit. This is the initial state of this interesting circuit, let's say. Uh, you can see that uh, the result is 1 with these inputs applied to it. But let's assume that uh, uh, we go from 1 to 0. Uh, 
uh, as opposed to uh, staying at zero. Now, if you actually do that, uh, what, what happens is there are two paths that are really affecting your output, right? One path is uh, initially if you're one, uh, uh, that means that uh, this is one. So this path is also, this, this path is changing from one to zero. Uh, and this path is also changing from, uh, let's say uh, this was zero. So this path is changing from zero to one, right? So if the fast path changes faster, it might be that your output may go from one to zero briefly and then to one again. So basically what happens if this changes from one to zero, this path path quickly changes and then the output becomes zero for a short amount of time. And then the slow path changes a little bit later. It basically, uh, what, what the fast path does is this fast path uh, puts the circuit back to zero because both of them are zero. And then soon after that, the slow path evaluates to one and this becomes a one again. So there is an output, there's a period of time where the output remains a zero for a short time because this fast path changes the output uh, more quickly than the slow path can. That's the idea of a glitch. So you may actually briefly get a zero output over here uh, for some time, even though at some point the circuit settles to uh, one because the slow path actually catches up and evaluates, right? And that's the idea, basically. I've already shown you that. And if you actually look at the timing diagram, it looks this way. Uh, basically, B changes. Uh, B, when B changes, N2 changes faster than N1, because you can clearly see that there's only one gate over here. There are two gates over here. And then because of that, uh, there's a glitch for some amount of time. But then the glitch goes back to 1 uh, after N1 also changes, as you can see over here. So for this amount of time, you have some glitch in the output. Now, this doesn't matter if you don't do anything with this output in the glitch. Make sense? If basically you don't sample this and put it into a latch, for example, put it into a flip-flop, then maybe you don't care about this, right? But this may matter if you actually sample at this point and put it into a sequential logic uh, flip-flop, as we will see in a little bit. So basically, whether or not this glitch matters is really dependent on what you do with the output signal and when, when you do something to the output signal. So if you actually designed your circuit such that you actually sample uh, the data at the time it is glitching, Bad idea, right? Then uh, you actually have a problem. Pro actually, it's a problem because you really didn't really calculate the, the maximum propagation delay in your circuit very well. You didn't take into account the slow path, right? So you need to take into account your slow path. So if you take into account your worst case conditions and slow paths, these glitches should normally not matter. But again, that's a general rule that doesn't always apply. It really depends on what the designer does with the output signal. Okay. So basically, you can avoid these glitches. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, exactly how you avoid them, but uh, well, I, I am going to talk about them briefly. But basically, by adding some additional circuitry that ensures that a fast path doesn't cause a glitch in the output is the way to avoid these. The question is, how do you add them? So the reason this happens is really uh, you don't have redundancy in the circuit. So if you had another term over here uh, that calculates that changes based on B, uh, uh, and uh, that ensures that no, uh, uh, no fast path can cause, to this, cause this glitch, then you're actually solved the problem. Basically, you can actually design a circuit that doesn't glitch. That's what, I, uh, that's what I mean by what I said. But to be able to do that, you need to add some other function of the inputs as part of, the, uh, part of an, another input to the OR gate. So that becomes a three input OR gate, of course. Of course, it's not very desirable. And as a result, you may avoid the glitch, but now your area increases. So if, if these glitches are not a problem in your design and make sure you, they don't, they're not a problem in your design, then I wouldn't worry about them. But you need to make sure to, uh, that you don't uh, create, a, create the problem of glitches by using a glitching output in somewhere that's important. Okay, so we did not cover K maps, Carnot maps, uh, as we, uh, uh, as, and as I mentioned that they were optional, but very quickly, these glitches can be visible uh, in, uh, your truth table, let's say. So Carnot maps is one example of a truth table, basically. This is A, B, C, and Y is the output. So this is one way of visualizing the output. A, B is 0, 0, A, B is 0, 1, A, B is 1, 1, A, B is 1, 0 over here, and then C is 0, 1. And this is the function, output function over here uh, that uh, is essentially the truth table for the circuit. And you can see that uh, this circuit really implements A bar, B bar, or B, C. Now, the problem is when you move from... Uh, uh, when you change B from one to zero, there is no redundancy uh, here uh, 
to ensure that you don't glitch. So to be able to fix this glitch, you add another term, which is essentially considering this part. So don't worry about the k-maps over here. And if you're really worried about the k-maps, take a look at uh, the lecture that I mentioned earlier when we talked about logic minimization. But the solution is really adding one more term like this. Whether you do it through the k-maps or through your Boolean equations, doesn't matter. In this case, uh, the slides talk about k-maps, but I'm not going to talk about them. But basically, we ensure that there is a no transition between different prime implicants. If you remember, implicants, implicants are these. Prime implicants are implicants that actually uh, uh, are, are, uh, are not reducible, uh, are not eliminatable uh, uh, between each other. But basically, we add a redundant term that could easily be eliminated if you want to minimize a circuit. But we add this redundant term to make sure that uh, the output is not dependent on B. And now we've eliminated that glitching, if you uh, see over here. So even though B changes, uh, Y never glitches because of this redundant term. OK, so hopefully that's clear. But of course, this is not desirable, right? Now we added one more gate. And uh, we clearly added, made this a three input OR gate. So we increased the area and power requirements of the circuit. So the question is, do we always care about glitches? I, or I already. Uh, said this basically, fixing glitches is undesirable. More design effort, more area, more power consumption. And the circuit is eventually guaranteed to converge to the right value regardless of glitchiness, except if you do the wrong thing with a glitching output, right? And the wrong thing is uh, uh, basically, a wrong thing is basically latching that glitching output, for example, to somewhere you care about. So basically, we don't always care about glitches if we have a good design. If we care about the long term steady state output and if we actually calculate our delays correctly, we can safely ignore glitches because we calculate our delays correctly such that even though the output may be glitching for a while, we're not going to use uh, the output uh, while it's glitching. Right? Uh, and again, it's up to the designer to decide if glitches matter in their application when examining similar. For example, one important place where this matters is when you're debugging your circuit and when you're examining your simulation output, it's important that you recognize the glitches. Because if you don't recognize the glitches, uh, then you may actually think, oh, something wrong is happening, right? Uh, so I would recommend understanding glitches uh, uh, from that perspective. Okay, so can, uh, there's one question. Can we just put two buffers in front of N2 to fix that glitch? I mean, maybe your solution is similar to what is described over here. Uh, uh, I don't know what the N2 is over here, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, okay, basically what you're saying is basically try to make sure that the delays are equalized, right? Uh, yes, possibly. But then you need to be very careful in terms of how you equalize the delays. And it's usually not so easy to equalize the delays, basically. You may still reduce the glitch, but you may not be able to get rid of the glitch. So the best way of fixing the glitch is really adding some terms to the Boolean equation such that you don't even get the glitch in the output. And these are redundant terms, clearly. That makes the circuit suboptimal in terms of uh, the size. OK. OK, now let me go into sequential circuit timing. And uh, we'll take a break, I think, somewhere in the middle or after the sequential circuit timing. Uh, but I want to cover sequential circuit timing now that we've covered combinational timing, because it follows directly from combinational timing. We're going to make use of the combinational timing in the sequential time. Uh, by the way, that's a very good question, uh, the, the two buffers. Uh, equalizing the delays may potentially be attractive, but they may not always be easily possible. OK, so recall the D flip-flop. Uh, flip-flop samples D at the active or rising clock edge, and it outputs a sample value of Q, uh, value to Q. Essentially, it stores a sample value until the next active clock edge, right? And this is uh, our abstraction. But we also know that the flip-flop is made from combinational elements, right? And I, I, we gave one example of a flip-flop. Uh, there are other many, many different implementations of a D flip-flop, actually, which did not really cover internally. But uh, all of these D, Q and clock all have timing requirements. And that's the essence of sequential time. So let's take a look at the D flip-flop input timing constraints. Uh, let's take a look at this, basically. So the clock, uh, essentially, clock rises. There's an active clock edge. And while the clock rises, the D input must be stable. Essentially, while the clock is rising, it's being sampled. During the sampling time, this D input must be stable. So what is the sampling time? The sampling time is also called the aperture time. If you're, if you're used to photography, for example, uh, aperture time is the time during which the camera lens should be open right, and stable also. During that time, you're capturing the image. Essentially, here, we're capturing the value that is at the input. But it takes some time, basically. D needs to be uh, 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 stable for some time before the, clocks, the clock starts rising. 
and sometime after the clock starts, right? So why does this happen? Because of the internal design uh, of the D flip-flop, because internally you're using the, uh, there's some sampling mechanism that takes D and propagates to, it to Q, right? And that takes time, as we have seen in, the, in one implementation of the D flip-flop in, uh, in lecture six, uh, you have a, a, a stage one master latch, stage two slave latch, and it takes time to propagate the D to the output of the slave latch. And that was not the most efficient implementation of a D flip-flop, by the way. You could actually implement a D flip-flop in a much uh, nicer way, let's say, but it was easier for us to actually show that uh, with logical signals at that time. So basically, you need to obey these setup and hold time constraints. So setup time is the time before the clock edge that data or D must be stable, stable meaning not changing. It should stop changing at that point. Before that, it could change. But at this point, uh, until uh, the clock edge, uh, T setup time, it should not change. And hold time is time after the clock edge that the data must be stable because the internal circuitry of this flip-flop may actually be processing that data before or after, essentially. Okay, essentially aperture time is the time around the clock edge that the data must be stable. And aperture time is T setup plus T hold. So this is very fundamental. This is how a flip-flop operates. And we're gonna base every discussion of a sequential system based on this uh, assumption. So usually, let me put it this way. Currently, people try to minimize the hold time as much as possible to zero. But that's not always the case. Uh, people play a lot of tricks internally to minimize the whole time, but that's not always the case. So you still need to worry about that if your flip-flops don't have zero whole time. And usually they have non-zero, almost always actually, they have non-zero setup time. Okay, so before we go into this, let's talk very briefly about metastability. Basically, if D is changing while it's sampled, metastability can occur. And this was also uh, something we discussed uh, when we uh, talked about the SR latch, right? Essentially, the flip-flop output becomes stuck somewhere between one and zero. And output eventually over time settles non-deterministically. You don't actually know what it will settle to. It may settle based on the variation in some components of the circuit, for example. And this is one example of metastability, for example. So this is, if you have a NAND, this is from NAND RS latch, uh, and this is real simulation. And you can see that uh, the clock changes and Q changes because the data is not shown over here, but fine. Uh, but after the clock uh, changes, Q changes, but it settles to some value between zero and one. So assume that this is one, assume that this is zero. And you can see that it settles to uh, some value between zero and one for some time, it's metastable. And then there are many possible paths it can take. So these are simulations of many different potential paths uh, the Q value can take. So it may go to one, it may go to zero, but you don't know basically what it will go to. So this is why you should really avoid uh, changing D in this aperture time uh, window. Because if you change D in the aperture time window, the circuit is not guaranteed to be stable. It becomes metastable. And the output you get may be, uh, D, D may get, uh, Q may get D, or Q may get not D. After it's, of course, stabilizes. And it may take some time to stabilize, which actually uh, uh, causes some delay in your circuitry. So it may mess up everything downstream in your circuitry. So essentially, don't violate the aperture time uh, requirements. OK, so let's talk about the output timing over here in flip-flop also. So that was the flip-flop D to Q time. Now this is the output timing, clock to Q timing. So flip-flop, as you can see, that's two inputs, right? One is D to Q. And there's some timing requirement from D to Q, as we discussed, the setup time and the hold time. There's also a time timing requirement from clock to Q, as you can see. after clock rises, Q starts changing, and that's the clock to Q contamination delay. That's the minimum time it takes after clock changes or rises uh, for Q to change. And this is really very similar to the contamination delay of a, a gate as we discussed earlier. This is the minimum possible delay of the flip-flop uh, from the clock. And PCQ is the mi maximum possible delay for Q to change after clock changes. Essentially, this is a delay after which Q definitely settles. Uh, uh, and that's the uh, uh, propagation delay from C to Q. Okay, and that's the definition basically. Contamination delay clock to Q, TCCQ, is the earliest time after the clock edge that Q starts to change. In other words, it's potentially unstable, but it may also change. That's the shortest possible path, let's say, from clock to Q. And propagation delay clock to Q is the latest time after the clock edge that Q stops changing 
meaning that it becomes completely stable. And this is the longest possible delay from clock to queue. And this is going to be important because this is going to affect how long it takes for us to get the queue. Clearly, queue is going to be used, which is the flip-flop output, right? It's going to be used in some combination of logic inside a finite state machine, right? Uh, or as part of your sequential system. Uh, so this delay affects when Q is available to you, right? And that delay, it needs to be added to your combinational delay to really get how long it takes for you to uh, 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 get the result out of a combinational circuit starting from the clock uh, rising edge. That's why this delay is extremely important. Again, that's true for the shortest signal as well, right? Uh, you need to know both the shortest path and the longest path. So that's why we need to know the shortest clock to queue and longest clock to queue delays. Okay, now let's talk about sequential system design. Uh, essentially, uh, a sequential system looks like this. Uh, and this is very similar to a finite state machine, except we're not going to put the output of the combination logic or uh, next state logic from here to here, but we're going to latch the next state, uh, like latch the output of the combination logic into some other register. And we're going to see why this is beneficial later on when we talk about pipelining, for example. Uh, you have some system. There are some inputs uh, which are in, the, in this register, let's say. Um, or it could be ba it's, it's based on flip-flops. And then you operate on those values. You do something combinational. That results in some output. And then you lash the data in some other register. And this takes some clock cycle time. And this is really the clock cycle time of your processor, for example. And we will see later on how this is determined in pipelining. Don't worry about that right now. But assume that we have a system that uh, operates uh, based on this. You have R1 and then combination logic. Result is latched to R2. And then you take the uh, output of uh, well, uh, the value in, the, in this over here, uh, put it into another combination logic, and then the result is latched to R3. And then you take the output of R3, put it into another combination logic, the result is latched to R4, dot, dot, dot. That way, you can actually do many, many combinational operations in the same clock cycle and then move the data in a pipeline manner to the next stage, if you will. Don't worry about it if you don't understand it that way, but that's the reason why we're plotting it this way over here. The same thing applies actually absolutely the same way if you actually take D2 and put it into this register, except it's going to, uh, uh, you can also think of it that way, basically. Uh, so you can think of it as a finite state machine where it ta you take D2 and put it back into this register, state register, or you can have it as a sequential system where you have multiple different state registers and combination logic sits in between multiple different state registers. It's the same thing in the end. And the timing analysis will be very, very similar because they're both registers. And we're going to assume that those registers are the same. OK, so basically, you have multiple flip-flops connected with combination logic. We call them registers here. But essentially, register is made out of multiple flip-flops uh, uh, based on the bit width. And clock runs with a period. We're going to call this the cycle time. Now, this period is going to be given to us, or you determine it based on the maximum combination logic delay. Usually, what happens is it's determined based on some requirements, uh, like for the, uh, when you want to compete in the market. You say, my clock period is going to be 5 gigahertz, and you try to achieve it. You can actually achieve it by minimizing the combination logic that you have, by adjusting the combination logic that you have between these sequential uh, flip-flops, right? Uh, so basically, we have some control over the clock cycle time. But we're going to assume that clock runs with period clock cycle time, and we're going to try to compute it. And minimizing it, we'll discuss in a little bit also. Basically, to be able to do this uh, design, you need to meet this timing requirements for both R1 and R2. And again, if R1 and R2 are the same, the same thing applies. You still need to meet the timing requirements for R1 and R1, essentially, because you're going to take the data value over here and put it back into R1. Uh, so that's the key over here. If you want to really design a sequential system that looks like this, which is all computing systems that we have, you need to meet the timing requirements. So we're going to analyze the timing requirements. So how do we ensure correct sequential operation? So basically, you need to ensure correct input timing on R2 over here. And this is why things will, be, will become easier if you think, of, think about things as R2, for example. So basically, uh, you, have, you need to latch uh, the output of the combination logic, D2, into R2. And you want to latch the correct data, right? You don't want to latch a glitch. And you certainly don't want to latch something that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that is computed before the worst case delay. That's why you need to take into account the worst case delay from clock to uh, 
uh, all the way into uh, Q over here, as well as uh, any possible thing that can affect the worst case delay from any input over here to uh, the final latching of the data in R2. OK, specifically, uh, as we discussed earlier, the D2, which is the input signal to register 2 over here, must be stable during the aperture time of this flip-flop register 2, meaning that D2 must be completely stable at least T setup time before the clock edge and at least T hold time after the clock edge, right? As we discussed, right? It's the same thing, basically. You need to obey these requirements, but we're going to work our way backwards over here. So that means that you need to have enough time here after D2 is stable to set up and also hold. OK, now let's take a look at how this really affects the computation of the delay over here. We're going to compute the delay. This means that there is both a minimum and maximum delay between the two flip-flops. Again, if you want to imagine as a single flip-flop where the combinational output goes to the flip-flop, it's the same thing, basically. Uh, OK, uh, so this is what, we, what, we, what we're going to look at. So we have a clock cycle time. Assume that it's determined in some way. And that's really the, two, uh, the, the time between two rising edges of the clock, two consecutive rising edges of the clock. And that's obvious, hopefully. And during that time, you are going to compute in the computational logic, right? At this point, uh, the data value is going to be latched. After some point, Q1 will be completely available to the combination logic, as you can see over here, which is this part, clock to Q1 uh, propagation delay. And after some point, combination logic will settle. That's the Q1 to D2 propagation delay, which is really the propagation delay of this combination logic. And then you need to have enough setup time over here. But then there needs to be some hold time over here, as we will see also. OK, so basically, let's take a look at the hold time over here first. Uh, so if, if, for example, the combination logic is too fast, so let's assume that. Uh, so if, let's go back to this picture over here to make sure we understand the hold time. So what does the hold time say? The hold time of this register 2 says that D2 should not change too fast, meaning that after the clock rises, you can see that the clock is rising over here. After the and assume that the clock is rising at the same time for both registers over here. After the clock rises, this D2 must be stable for a while. Now, this may be violated if this combination logic is too fast, right? What does that mean? That means that if this combination logic quickly changes from 0 to 1 within the T hold time after the clock changes over here, then you may actually violate the hold time of the second register over here. That's the idea, basically. That's what I mean by combination logic being too fast. So if this combination logic is too fast, it may evaluate so fast that this register 2 doesn't have time to sample it within its hold time. As a result, you may actually violate the hold time of this register 2. Okay, And we don't want that clearly, because we will sample something wrong there. OK, you can see that, right? So a clock to uh, D2 over here should, not be, should be less than the T hold time of this register, so that we can avoid a potential R2 T hold violation at this register. OK, so hopefully that's clear. OK, if the combination logic is too slow, meaning that if D2 becomes available too late in the clock cycle, or maybe it doesn't even become available in the clock cycle, right? Uh, it's too long. Uh, it, this combination logic takes too long to evaluate. You may actually violate the setup time of this uh, register 2. Because this, what does the setup time of this register 2 say? Let's go back to this picture over here. It basically says, before the clock rises, we need to have some time for D to be completely stable. Otherwise, we may sample something wrong or we can become, we can become metastable, as we discussed. Right? So basically, we want to ensure that clock to D2 uh, over here doesn't violate the T setup. Right? And we're going to write up equations to ensure that, basically. And we want to, we want to ensure that we don't violate that T setup. OK, so let's take a look at the setup time constraint first. So I'm going to write equations right now. Uh, so safe timing depends on the maximum delay from R1 to R2, as I've shown you in this picture, actually. This is maximum delay, if you will. Uh, and the input to R2 must be stable at least T setup before the clock edge over here. So let's take a look over here. So we have T setup. And the D must be stable for at least T setup time. 
as we discussed over here. So we have a T clock cycle. Assume that it's given to us somehow, but we're going to make sure that it's greater than some value so that, uh, so basically, don't assume that it's given to us, basically. We're going to compute the uh, minimum possible uh, uh, clock cycle time, uh, clock cycle time that is required by this combination logic and the, sequ the sequential system. So first of all, you need to ensure that uh, the, uh, you're greater than the T setup. Uh, okay, let's start from the beginning, actually. First, first of all, you need to ensure that the input R2 must be stable at least T setup before the clock edge. But then there are other delays, right? Certainly, uh, the input uh, of this combination logic becomes available from the, lat from the earlier register uh, in T PCQ amount of time. Remember what this was is clock to Q delay, propagation delay, which is the worst case delay from clock to Q. So that's the worst case delay over here. And then in the combination logic, we have some propagation delay. Assume that it's fixed for now. So that takes some time. And then we need to ensure that uh, we wait enough time, the setup delay for D2 to be available in the clock cycle. And this is what our clock cycle equation is. T clock cycle should be large, larger than uh, clock to Q propagation delay and then the propagation delay of the combination logic, and then the setup delay of this register. OK? OK, so basically, uh, as you can see, the useful work over here is really the combination logic, right? Assuming that you optimize it, of course, right? It may, you may waste a lot of delay over there also if you didn't optimize it. But this is assumed that this is useful work. Com uh, the PCQ and setup times are completely wasted work. And we call the sequencing over overhead. This is really the amount of time wasted each cycle due to sequencing element timing requirements. So whenever you have synchronous circuits that are clock-based, you have the sequencing overhead, basically. And we have to pay the sequencing overhead. And if your clock cycle is actually very small, uh, th then actually this overhead may be very, very large as a fraction of the clock cycle. So I think uh, one of you may be asked, what if uh, the uh, propagation delay of the combination logic is too large? Then you increase your clock cycle. But what if you, somebody says your clock cycle should be 10 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz? Then you actually make sure that you don't put too much combination logic uh, to increase your propagation delay. So basically, you can control your clock cycle time by changing your propagation delay, uh, by changing what you put into the combination logic clearly, right? and by separating it to multiple stages. right? For example, if you need to complete an addition, you can say, oh, I'm not going to do the addition in one clock cycle. Uh, I'm going to do it in two clock cycles because I want to increase my frequency and I want to do part of the addition in this clock cycle and part of the addition in the next combination logic over here. That way you can reduce the clock frequency. Uh, you, can, you can reduce the clock cycle time of the addition uh, while uh, uh, essentially having a good uh, frequency while satisfying the frequency requirements. Right? So that's the idea basically. And that's, that's how you can pipeline the circuits as we discussed. So I, what I just told you is a form of pipelining. You don't do the full addition in one cycle. You just do half of it over here and then latch the data value and then half of it in the next clock cycle, if you will. Okay, if you didn't understand it, don't worry about it. We'll talk about pipelining. But you have some control over your TPD, actually, depending on how you design your sequential system. Okay, so this was a sequencing overhead. Now let's take a look at the T setup constraints uh, and uh, the design performance. So remember, critical path is the path with the longest TPD, right? Uh, now, uh, overall design performance is really determined by critical path TPD, and then you pay the sequencing overhead on top of that, right? Uh, so a TPD determines the minimum clock period, max operating frequency, but that's not enough. You also need to add TPCQ and T setup times. If the critical path is too long, the design will run slowly, clearly. If the critical path is too short, each cycle will do very little useful work, meaning that most of the cycle will be wasted in the sequencing overhead, TPCQ plus T setup, as we discussed. Now, let me cover the hold time constraints. Uh, uh, we've covered the setup time constraint, which really affects your uh, critical uh, uh, clock cycle time, as we discussed. Let's cover the hold time constraint, because that's going to make things a, a little bit interesting. So safe timing also depends on the minimum delay from R1 to R2. And now, this, uh, now hopefully, it'll become clear why minimum delay matters. I promise that I will talk about minimum delay and why it matters. It matters because of the hold time constraint, basically. So let's take a look. Essentially, D2, R2 input must be stable for at least T hold after the clock edge. If the combination logic is way too fast, this may not be maintained, right? So basically, D2 must not change until T hold after the clock. So what does this mean? So 
what is the minimum delay from clock to D2? It's really the minimum delay from clock to Q for the combination logic to start as uh, with Q1 as the input. That's the minimum delay. That's CCQ, as we discussed, plus the minimum delay, contamination delay, uh, from the co uh, combination logic, within the combination logic. And we already discussed that. That's the shortest pass. Basically, that's the shortest delay from clock to Q and the shortest delay from uh, within the combination logic. If you add them up, they have to be greater than the T hold. That's what the hold time constraint means, right? Because if they're smaller than T hold, then you're violating the T hold constraint and the aperture time. And you may be sampling a wrong and changing value and you can become metastable in R2, right? Okay, so if you actually rewrite this equation, this means that TCD should be greater than T hold minus TTCQ, which means that you need to have a minimum combinational delay, right? Unless this is negative, of course, right? Unless TCCQ is already large enough uh, or uh, T hold is already zero, right? Um, so in many cases, T hold may be zero uh, or T hold may be smaller than TCCQ. As a result, this may not matter. But in some cases, this may not hold. As a result, you may need to do something about it. And what is that something? Well, something is adding additional delay on the minimum delay path, right? Shortest path. Uh, adding buffers, for example, right? That's the idea. So a hold time constraint is actually a bit dangerous. Uh, it doesn't depend on the clock cycle time, as you can see. It completely depends on the minimum delay path and the hold time and the CCQ time, as we discussed. And it's very hard to fix the hold violations after manufacturing. You must modify circuits, basically. Uh, or you need to have reconfigurable circuits in some way, right? Because you can easily fix uh, setup time violations uh, or clock cycle violations after manufacturing, right? Run your clock slower, slow enough that you don't have these violations. But hold time violations, sorry, you cannot fix them by changing the clock because it's independent of the clock frequency or clock cycle time. Okay, so let me summarize this and then uh, we're going to take a break. So hopefully this is really interesting. I, I find all of this fascinating. But imagine you're doing this for a very complicated circuit. We're doing it with essentially right now uh, abstracted circuits, right? Uh, if you do it with a complicated circuit, this becomes even more complicated. So this is the summary of what we have seen. TCCQ and TPD are combination logic delays minimum and maximum. T setup is the time flip-flop inputs must be stable before the next clock edge or before a clock edge. And T hold is the time that flip-flop inputs must be stable after a clock edge. And TC is a clock period, as we discussed, right? So you can actually, you need to obey all of these equations that I showed you earlier. Let me do some timing analysis now. And this is from your book also. Uh, and this is one circuitry, as you can see. They, 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 it has four inputs, four flip-flops, A, B, C, D, and then two outputs, X, Y. They're both controlled by the clock. And you can see that the combination logic is relatively simple over here. And these are the values that we are given. CCQ, PCQ, T setup, T hold, and the per gate propagation and combination logic delays. They're very given per gate, and all gates are essentially assumed to be same in this case. So let's take a look at both the setup time. So for this circuit to work, you need to make sure that the setup time constraints are obeyed and the hold time constraints are obeyed. And these are the equations that I showed you earlier. T clock cycle time must be greater than the, uh, the summation of PCQ, PD, and setup, and TCCQ plus TCD must be greater than the hold time. And I'm giving you all the reasons for it. Now let's calculate the PD and CD over here. We already given the TPCQ, right? It's 50 picoseconds over here. And we already given the uh, setup over here and CCQ over here and then hold over here as well. So what is the PD? So PD is essentially three times 35 picoseconds, three gate delays, 105 picoseconds. CD, which is the contamination shortest path delay is really 25 picoseconds. In, it happens in two possible cases, right? Okay. So now we plug in the numbers to the equations. So our clock cycle time should be greater than TPCQ, clock to Q delay maximum, plus maximum propagation delay through the combination logic, plus the setup time, which is 215 picoseconds. So basically, assuming that you're, you leave your combination logic as is, your maximum clock frequency can be 4.65 gigahertz, which is one divided by uh, the clock, frequency, uh, clock cycle time, right? in this case, which is not bad, but we're only using three, three logic gates here. So you really want faster logic gates if you really want to maximize your frequency, as you can imagine, right? Okay, so here there's nothing to really change, if you will. The only thing that you can change is TPD. If you say, okay, I'm not reaching five gigahertz, so let me try to 
change TPD. And there are multiple ways of changing TPD, which is getting rid of one gate and doing it later in some other cycle, uh, later in some other combination logic, or getting faster gates, as I said. Uh, or you increase your clock frequency and basically say, OK, I wanted 5 gigahertz, but I'm not achieving 5 gigahertz. I'm not willing to do more design changes. I'm going to stick with 4.65 gigahertz. OK, so this is easier to handle in a sense. Uh, but of course, if you're targeting a very aggressive frequency, it may be uh, you need to be aggressive in how to handle it. OK, hold time is not as easy to handle as we discussed. Let's take a look first. Is there a problem? Uh, uh, TCCQ, uh, OK, TCCQ plus TCD must be greater than our hold time. And in this case, TCCQ plus TCD is 55, and it's not greater than 70 picoseconds. So this circuit will fail, which means that you need to go back and do something about the hold time constraints. So how do we fix the hold time constraint? I, as I said, you, as I mentioned, you need to add buffers, basically. And enough buffers so that the hold time constraint doesn't, is, it doesn't get violated. So the short paths are essentially, if the hold time constraint is being violated, that means that the short paths are too short. So you need to make them long enough to not violate uh, the hold time constraints. OK, so let's take a look now. Uh, assuming that we add buffers to the short paths like this, uh, now you can calculate the propagation delay, maximum delay. Didn't change. But the contamination delay actually changed to 50 picoseconds. So our clock frequency didn't change because we didn't change the maximum delay. We did change the, uh, so, so max frequency didn't change. That's good. But now we passed the uh, set a hold time violation, right? Because we added a buffer that takes about 30 picoseconds. Well, it's somewhere over here. Sorry. It takes, uh, it takes essentially 25 picoseconds, sorry. Because each gate contamination delay is 25 picoseconds. And then now you have two gates in the shortest path. So you basically pass. So this was not desirable, as you can see, right? We didn't really want this, but we had to do this because of the whole time constraints of the flip-flop. And uh, that's a fact of life. That's, this is exactly why a lot of flip-flops are very, very carefully designed to really minimize the whole time constraints, uh, essentially. Uh, but you may actually get whole time constraints. And if you violate them, uh, your life will be very, very complicated. OK, uh, so I think this is a good place to take a break. Uh, we're going to take a uh, talk about clock skew, which is also going to be very important. Uh, but uh, I think this is going to be uh, a good time, because clock skew is something that's going to add a little bit more time into the clock cycle time. So let's take a break until, uh, I guess, 3, 3.35. I'll give you a 10-minute break. Uh, and then we're going to cover the rest. And then we're going to talk about clock skew. <laughs> So remember, this is where we are. Basically, we looked at uh, sequential system timing. And uh, you need to make sure you obey the setup and hold time constraints in a sequential system uh, to make sure that everything works. Uh, and these constraints are really determined uh, by uh, the uh, sequential element timing, which is a flip-flop timing. Uh, and th those are uh, based on uh, when you actually sample the data uh, while the clock is rising, right? So that's why this is really important. But clock secure actually affects uh, both of these timings, as we will see. Uh, and what does this mean? Basically, this, uh, so far, we've assumed that a uh, clock doesn't have any delay. It arrives, so if you go back to the system that we're examining, actually, this is fine. If you look at the system, clock arrives at the imp this, this first set of flip-flops, let's say R1. At the same time, it arrives at the second set of flip-flops. But that's not necessarily true also. There is a delay in the clock distribution uh, in real systems. And the clock doesn't reach all parts of the chip at the same time. It may reach R1 a little bit earlier or later, depending on how it's distributed. And clock secure is the time difference between two clock edges that, that are input to different registers. So you can see the clock source. And then uh, there is, uh, it goes to register A and register B. And there might be a delay associated uh, between the uh, time it changes, the clock change at A versus B because of the way it's distributed, right? And that leads to uh, a timing diagram that looks like this. So clock doesn't immediately uh, appear at all of the registers at the same time, but there's a skew uh, at which it appears in different registers, in different points, let's say. And this is one real example from a real chip. This is Alpha 21264, which was designed in the uh, mid to late 1990s. And this was the fastest processor of its time, actually. And you can see there's a distribution of the skew 
uh, of the clock uh, in terms of the physical location uh, where it goes in the chip, right? And you can see this uh, spatial distribution of the skew. And you can see that at some places, the skew is very small, closer to zero, let's say. But at some places, the skew is closer to 70 or 60 uh, picoseconds. So there's a huge dis difference in, in the delay. And you can see that this looks like a, a mountain shape. There are four mountains over here. This is because the clock is distributed in terms of a tree structure in this chip. Uh, you have, a, you have a, essentially a tree, as we will see in a, in a later slide. Uh, uh, and that tree uh, determines the shape of the skew also. And also there's manufacturing variation, et cetera, uh, that affects uh, the skew that you see. Uh, and that affects these edges, for example, that you see over here. OK, so let's take a look at uh, the setup time and revisit it uh, when we consider the clock skew. So safe timing now requires considering the worst case clock skew. Uh, so let's take a look at this. So let's assume that the clock arrives at R2 before it arrives at R1, which means that it leaves as little time as possible for the combination logic, right? Uh, because what happens is it, if it arrives at R2 before it arrives at R1, now uh, there's some clock skew that needs to be added because uh, the, the time that's available for uh, the, the, the signal Q1 over here is much smaller than before. If it arrived at the same time, then you would have more time. But because it arrives earlier over here and later over here, you have less time within this combinational block. Right? So this is the picture of it, of it over here. Basically, clock one comes late. That's the uh, darker shaded clock over here. And clock two comes early. Now you, your delay is clock to Q1 Prop, uh, propagation delay plus the propagation delay of the combination logic plus the setup time plus the skew, right? Because there is some skew that you need to deal with over here, right? Okay, so essentially, the signal must arrive at D2 earlier, and this effectively increases uh, your T setup time, right? Uh, so now basically, the equation uh, for your clock cycle time is the time from clock to Q propagation delay uh, plus the propagation delay of the circuitry plus the setup time of the uh, second latch plus the clock skew. You need to take clock skew into account now because we ignored it uh, previously, which essentially increase your setup time now. Uh, basically, your setup time, effective setup time is not just the setup time, but the skew at which uh, the clock arrives. Because the clock arrives early over here, you're really... Uh, you can also think, think of it as a uh, clock uh, is arriving early at register two, which means that your aperture time or setup time is really increasing at R2, okay? Now, if the clock arrived before, uh, earlier at R1 before R2, uh, this would not be a problem, right? Now you have more time uh, in the combination logic. So setup time would not be a problem, but your hold time may be a problem in that case, right? Uh, because now this, uh, you have, you're, you're much faster over here and you're slower over here in terms of when the clock is. Uh, OK, so basically, you need to take this into account. Now, let's take a look at the hold time now. Uh, and uh, this is basically what I'm going to say, what I just said earlier. Uh, if the clock arrives earlier over here, then uh, hold time will become problematic. Right? So basically, safe timing requires considering the worst case skew again. Uh, clock arrives at R2 after R1. That's the worst case over here. So if it arrives at R2, after it arrives at R1, then you have more time over here in this combination logic. And essentially, you need to make sure that uh, your combination logic still obeys the whole time requirements uh, of the R2. And this increases the minimum time required uh, for the combination logic, essentially. So let's take a look at this over here. So clock one arrives early, which for R1, clock two arrives late over here. So you can see the clock to Q minimum delay, contamination delay puts us over here. And then we have a contamination delay over the circuit. So now TCCD uh, plus uh, TCD should be greater than TSQ plus T hold, right? Because TSQ is over here, as you can see, right? There's a skew amount of time that is essentially eaten up by the clock delay. Okay, basically signal must arrive at T2 later, and this effectively increases T hold, as I said over here. TCD plus TCCQ must be greater than T hold time of uh, the register plus the clock skew. And we call this T hold effective. Essentially, because of the clock's Q, effective hold time of the register increases because you have additional delay uh, for uh, your signal to be stable 
after the clock arrives there because of the skew, right? Okay, so hopefully this is clear. I mean, this is uh, intuitive if you think about it a little bit, but a lot of the things that we discuss over here require some thinking uh, to settle. Uh, you may not uh, immediately understand everything that I explain. If you do immediately understand, that's great actually, but usually uh, this requires some thinking and uh, usually that thinking is actually needs to be done a little bit offline in my opinion. And if you really want to understand these, I would recommend uh, going through the slides plus going through the chapter uh, chapters that I mentioned earlier in Harris and Harris. This, uh, this topic doesn't appear in Pat and Patel, but in Harris and Harris, this appears and it, it has a very good explanation uh, of these concepts. Okay, to summarize, skew effectively increases both T setup and T hold essentially. Things that are a part of our sequencing overhead, right? Essentially, they incre it increases sequencing overhead, meaning that it causes less useful work done per cycle. So designers in general must keep skew, clock skew to a minimum. And this requires some intelligent clock network across the chip. And there's a lot of research on this topic at the lower level clock distribution. Actually, this is true for power as well. How do you distribute power? But I'm not going to even go into the power at this point. So essentially, the goal is to ensure that clock arrives at all locations at roughly the same time. But it's easier said than done. So you can see that there are many, many different types of uh, clock networks, if you will, that are designed to distribute the clock. So you have a source for the clock. And then you basically distribute it across your entire chip, let's say. The question is, how do you distribute the, so uh, the clock from the uh, source, let's say the ring oscillator, all the way to uh, every single uh, circuit that needs it in a way that minimizes the skew? And there's a lot of work in this topic that I'm not going to go into. But in the end, you cannot get rid of the skew. You can reduce it, but you cannot get rid of it. OK, so let, let, let's, let's talk about circuit verification in the next parts. These next parts are going to be uh, interesting and easier and more practical from your lab perspective, because in your labs, you'll have to deal with verifying your circuits. And the key question in circuit verification is how do you know that a circuit works? Uh, you have designed a circuit. Is it functionally correct? That's the first question. Even if it's function the functional correctness is the same as logical correctness, basically. Even if it's functionally or logically correct, does the hardware meet all of the timing constraints? Now, the question is, of course, how do we do this verification? How can we test for functionality and timing? And the main answer that we're going to use in this course is really simulation tools. So Vivado, for example, in this course is going to be your friend to enable functional verification, timing verification. Uh, you could also do a circuit level simulation at the lower level, like SPICE is another tool for circuit level simulation. You're not going to deal with over here. If you take a microelectronics design class, for example, you will deal with SPICE. Or you could formally verify a circuit. This is especially true for functionality. Uh, timing is much harder. But you could use, for example, satisfiably, test, satisfiably t t t testing solvers, SAT solvers, in other words, or form of verification tools, other similar form of verification tools, to formally verify that your circuit actually does what it's intended to do. And we're not going to talk about that. Also, again, if you take a formal verification class, they may cover hardware design, because some of these formal verification tools are applied to hardware also. But in this class, we're going to talk about simulation tools uh, quite a bit. So uh, this brings us to testing large digital designs. So testing, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, can be the most time consuming design stage. You need to ensure functional correctness of all logic paths. You need to ensure timing, power, et cetera, uh, of all circuit elements. They're within the bounds, and they're correct. Unfortunately, low-level simulation is much slower than high-level simulation. So circuit-level simulation, spice simulation is much slower than Vivado or C-level simulation. So basically, we normally split responsibilities in this. We usually check functionality only at a high level, like C or hardware description language, because this allows us to do simulate fast with high co code coverage. And we can easily write and run tests at that high level of abstraction, because things are much faster. Whereas if you do it at a circuit level, things are much slower. Uh, and also, you need to be more detailed in the modeling, which makes the modeling slower also uh, to begin with. Uh, and also, we check uh, only timing, power, et cetera, at a lower level or circuit level. And we usually don't do functional testing, uh, whether, you, whether the circuit implements this function at a, using a low-level model. But we test the functional equivalence to the high-level model. So if you have a circuit model, is it really equivalent to the higher-level model? Now, this is hard, but easier than testing logical functionality at that level. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of this. Your book actually has more uh, detail, uh, and some other books have even more detail. Uh, so we have tools to handle different levels of verification. Uh, logic synthesis tools guarantee equivalence of high-level logic and synthesized circuit-level description. So basically, you write in hardware description language. You give it to a tool that synthesizes the hardware description language. And hopefully, 
somebody verified it formally or uh, in some, with some other testing methods that it's guaranteed to be correct. That's what you're relying on over there. Timing verification tools check circuit timings. And uh, sometimes your synthesis tools actually do that also. Uh, in fact, you will see that they will. Uh, but they may not be perfect in this case. Uh, and then there's design rule checks uh, that ensure that physical circuits are build buildable. This is basically uh, whether the transistors are too close to each other, for example, whether the gates are too close to each other, whether you make sure that the wires are large enough uh, to carry the load that they're subjected to. Clearly, we're not at that, we're not at that level in this course. This is at a lower level than what we're going to cover in this course. So we're not going to go and talk about design rule checks. But the task of a logic designer is to provide functional tests for logical correctness of the design and to provide timing constraints or, for example, the desired operating frequency uh, to make sure that the design actually works. Right? Uh, and also, you need to somehow make, make sure that the hold time constraints are not violated. Right? That's also the task of a logic designer, unfortunately, as we have seen earlier. Uh, so basically, tools and or, and or circuit engineers will decide whether the design can be built in the end. So if you're synthesizing your design, tools will uh, make sure that uh, uh, whether the design will be built or not, uh, or give you an answer, let's say. And if you actually are designing uh, the circuit uh, using via circuit engineers, or you're designing it yourself, you will design, you will decide if it can be built. Okay, so that's part of the uh, uh, verification. Let, let's talk about functional verification, uh, because you're going to do a lot of that basically in the course. You're, you're actually hopefully doing that already. Basically, the goal is to check functional or logical correctness of this design. Well, you can also think about it as Boolean functionality, right? Does this circuit implement the Boolean function that it is supposed to implement? Uh, so in this verification, usually we ignore physical circuit timing, like T set up T hold, because you don't want to mess, mix uh, uh, things at the conceptual level. And this becomes uh, just a nuisance at that level. You may implement simple checks to catch obvious bugs if you want to. But we'll discuss timing verification later in this lecture as part five. There are two primary approaches to functional verification. One is logic simulation using test routines, for example, C, C++, Verilog. Or you can use formal verification, as I said, using SAT solvers. We're not going to do SAT solving or formal verification, but we're going to do logic simulation in this course. And we're going to use Verilog for functional verification. And we're going to build test benches in Verilog to be able to do that. So let me introduce test bench based functional testing. Test bench is essentially a module that's created specifically to test a design. Uh, test a design is also called DUT or device under test. Uh, and the test bench looks like this at a high level. Basically, you have a test pattern generator, and there are multiple ways of generating test patterns, which are applied to inputs. And then you, uh, you observe the outputs at the end, and you check whether the outputs actually correspond to the correct outputs that you determine somehow, as we will see. Uh, so test bench provides inputs or test patterns to the design under test. And design under test could be either the entire system or it could be part of a system. It could be, for example, the sequential system that we showed earlier. Uh, the question is, how do you provide the test patterns to test the system? You can have test handcrafted values or you can have automatically generated values, sequentially generated. You basically start with, let's, let's assume that you have three inputs. You enumerate all possible inputs, for example, right? Let's you have, if you have had 32 inputs, maybe you randomly test different inputs. That may, may or may, may not be a good idea. And the test band checks outputs of the design under test against handcrafted values, uh, golden outputs that you know to be correct, or compares it to the output of a golden design that's known to be absolutely correct or bug-free. We will see these differences between these two approaches in a little bit. So basically, a test bench can be a hardware description level, a language level code uh, written to test other HDL modules. Or it could be a circuit schematic used to test other circuit designs. Uh, test bench is not designed for hardware synthesis. This is not something you synthesize. I mentioned this in the last lecture, but hopefully it's clear. Uh, it's, the goal is really to run it in simulation only to check whether the functionality of your circuit is correct. And you can do it in HDL simulation. You can do it in SPICE simulation. Uh, you can uh, essentially, you can do it at, an, at any level of simulation uh, that you are comfortable with, uh, if you would like. Uh, Test bench uses simulation only constructs also. For example, you can say, wait 10 nanoseconds. We discussed this in the last lecture very briefly. Uh, basically, you can basically apply these inputs at any time you want to uh, see the waveform and when it changes, for example, uh, so that you can actually um, test whether your uh, system is functionally correct under different delays, for example. Uh, and then you, you, we assume ideal voltage current source, of course, and 
this is not suitable to be uh, physically built. So let's take a look at common Verilog test bench types. Essentially, there are multiple. So there could be a simple test bench uh, where everything is done manually. Input output generation and error checking, results checking, let's say, uh, are uh, done manually. So there's a lot of work for the designer, but for small circuits, it might work. Self-checking uh, test bench, input output generation is manual, but error checking is automatic. So you automatically compare things. And automatic test bench is basically both input output generation and error checking are automatic. So let's take a look at uh, some of these. So we will walk through different types of test benches you may design uh, during your labs, for example, to test a module that implements a simple logic function, as you can see. It's very simple, right? And at the end, this is another silly function, another one of those silly functions. And this is its very log implementation. It's not the greatest implementation, as you can see, but uh, it's, it's, it's the most explicit implementation over here, as you can see. So we basically explicitly instantiate inverters as well as gates, uh, the min term gates that uh, do the ends, and then we have the OR gate over here. So this is a very structural very log, as you can see. Uh, so we are going to use very log syntax for test benching. Essentially, uh, we have an initial block. It's like the always block, but runs only once at simulation start. So these are actually for simulation. These are very log constructs for simulation purposes. So we can set the value of a register to zero this way, and then use a blocking assignment, and then wait for 10 nanoseconds, do nothing, and then A becomes one. So this way you can simulate basically. And you can keep adding these things manually to your very log code, as you can see, so that you can decide when the inputs change. And then you can also display print messages, very similar to, to print-based print debugging, right? So let's take a look at our simple test bench. So we instantiate our silly function dot, and you saw the Verilog implementation of it earlier. And this is the test bench module, as you can see. And we have some registers and wires that are manually assigned. So this is going to be our manual test bench soon. And basically, we have an initial begin section. And then we apply hard code inputs one at a time. Initially, we apply A, zero, A, B, C, all zeros. And then wait for 10 nanoseconds. And then we change C to 1, wait for 10 nanoseconds. And then we change B to 1 and C to 0 to wait for 10 nanoseconds. And you keep doing this, basically. And at the waveform, you observe what the result is. Result is y over here. And the, while you simulate the circuit, the silly function, uh, while, uh, by applying inputs consecutively at different times, now you can see in the waveform output changing. And you basically verify whether the output corresponds to the correct output given an input. Right? It's so simple, basically, from that perspective. So basically, most common method for output checking is looking at waveform diagrams, as I mentioned. Basically, you apply some inputs, and you get some output. And you check the output at the right times. Now, of course, uh, there are thousands of signals over millions of clock cycles. Uh, printf is not a great way of debugging. Waveform also may not be a great way of debugging if actually you have many, many outputs, for example, if you need to check a lot of things. So uh, manually checking that output is correct at all times is good. And it's good when you're learning, when you look at small circuits. But it doesn't work very well with very large circuits also. So pros, essentially, with the simple test bench, completely manual, is easy to design. You can easily test a few specific inputs, for example, corner cases. But it's really not scalable to many test cases and large circuits also. And outputs must be checked manually outside of the simulation somehow. You can inspect dumped waveform signals. You can do printf style debugging. But none of them are really that scalable. So that brings us to the self-checking test bench, which is a little bit more uh, advanced, let's say. Basically, here, the key distinction is you apply the input. Uh, uh, OK, you apply the input, wait for some time. And then you check whether the output is correct. And then if the output is not correct, now you're encoding the outputs inside the test bench itself, as you can see. So the output is not one. You display, OK, this input failed. And then you apply another input. If the output is not as expected, you, have, you display it's failed. And you can do it in different ways, of course. You can do it via post-processing, et cetera. I'm not going to go through details. But again, this is still easy to design, still easy to test a few specific inputs, like corner cases. And simulator will print whenever an or error occurs if you do it nicely. So output checking is automatic, if you will, over here. But still, it's not very scalable to millions of test cases. And again, easy to make an error in the hard-coded values that you see over here. Basically, you make just as many errors writing a test bench as actual code over here. So it's not clear if this sort of test bench uh, is really that scalable to very large circuits. And I don't think it is, actually. And it's hard to debug whether there's a, when you have an issue, when you have an output failing, for example, whether there's an issue with your original circuit or whether it's an issue with your test bench. So now your test bench may introduce errors also. This doesn't sound good, right? Uh, so we need to be careful. Uh, OK. Uh, so the next uh, issue, uh, way of doing self-checking test bench is using test vectors. 
So now you can write a test vector file. You can be more intelligent. You can say, OK, I want a file, list of inputs, and expected outputs. Now you can create vectors manually and automatically using an already verified simpler golden model. We'll see this later on. So this is one example vect uh, test vector file, for example. If for input, three inputs, 0, 0, 0, output should be 1. 0, 0, 1, output should be 0. And you keep doing this for eight inputs. So that's the format. So with small circuits, it's easy to write. With large circuits, it's also a bit easier to hard code in the very log again, right? Because now you're doing it in a methodical way in a file. Uh, and now you use a clock signal for assigning the inputs and reading outputs. Now you can actually automate this much better, right? Let's take a look at how this is done. Uh, so basically, uh, you, uh, you test one test vector each clock cycle. Don't confuse this clock cycle with the timing that we discussed earlier. This is just for testing. It has nothing to do with the clock cycle of, uh, uh, of the circuit itself. Basically, this is the clock cycle that we use for testing. At the rising edge of the clock, we apply the inputs. At the falling edge of the clock, we check the outputs because we're doing functional simulation, right? And then at the rising edge of the clock, we apply the next test vector. And at the falling edge of the clock, we check whether the output of the circuits and see whether it matches the golden output. That's the idea. So basically, the goal of this clock signal is to simply separate inputs from outputs. It allows us to observe the inputs outputs in waveform diagrams. It's not used for checking physical circuit timing. It has nothing to do with timing over here. The, the use of the clock is done uh, just for the purpose of testing over here. And later, we will discuss circuit timing verification briefly in this lecture uh, soon. But basically, this is an easier way of doing that testing. Uh, essentially, we have this test bench 3. Now we have test vectors. You can see we can have 10,000 of these test vectors. Uh, and we have different vector numbers and errors, bookkeeping variables over here. We instantiate the device under test. You can see a more uh, detailed example in H and H, as you can see. We generate a clock. And essentially, clock, uh, clock is high for five nanoseconds, and then it's low for five nanoseconds, and it basically keeps repeating, right? There's no sensitivity list, so it always executes. So forever, this clock keeps repeating, basically. Uh, and then this is what we do. Uh, it only, the initial only executes once. It, you read the test vectors, and then basically do some reset, and then wait. And this is what you do before testing, basically. Always at the positive edge of clock, you apply uh, A, B, C to take the first three values of the test vectors and Y expected to be outputs, right? OK, basically apply A, B, C inputs on the rising edge of the clock. That's what the circuit does. So hopefully it's simple. And then you get Y expected for checking the output on the falling edge. And then rising and falling edges are chosen by convention over here. You can use any part of the clock signal if you wish. and the H and H textbook uses, uses the rising edge to apply the inputs and falling edge to check the outputs, basically. OK, this is your test bench, basically. This is the checking the outputs part, basically. If y is not equal to y expected, you get an error, basically. And then you basically keep, uh, 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 yeah, basically you get an error and you display the error. And then if test vectors, you reach the maximum, basically, you basically complete the test over here. So this is our test bench, basically. Over, over multiple slides, I showed you the test bench. This is the beginning of the test bench. This is how you generate the clock. This is how you read the file. This is how you apply each input in the text bench and uh, test bench and get the output. And then this is how you check the output at the negative edge of the clock over here, as you can see. So this is clearly much more scalable right, with uh, test vectors. It's easy to design, easy to test a few specific inputs, but more than that, probably. Simulator will print whenever an error occurs. And no, no need to change hard-coded values for different tests. You basically deal with a test vector file in this case. So it's a bit more scalable. But it may be error-prone depending on the source of the test vectors. It really depends on how you generate the test vectors over here. If you actually generate them hand, by hand, it's very error-prone. We will see how to generate them in a different way. It's more scalable, but still limited by reading a file. So you might have actually many more combinational paths to test than will fit in your memory. So this brings us to the automatic test bench, which is, in my opinion, the best way of testing. But for, this requires you to construct a golden model. So a golden model essentially represents the ideal circuit behavior, what the circuit is supposed to achieve. It must be developed independently and might, might be difficult to write. No question about that. It can be done in any language or even in a very log. But you can do it in C, for example, whatever you're comfortable with at a high functional level. For example. For our example circuit earlier, this could be our golden very log model, right? behavioral model. It's a high level abstraction. Clearly, this is a silly function. So the golden model is simple, as you can see. But this is our golden model. It doesn't have a structural implementation. Basically, this is a functional implementation, which we hope is completely correct. Because it's simpler than our earlier gate level structural description, golden model is usually easier to design and understand. And they should be. Otherwise, your golden model is no, no better than 
your original design, right? And it must be easier to verify. So somebody needs to verify the golden model as well. Okay, so this is important. So think about golden models all day. Now, how you design an automatic test bench becomes interesting, right? So the design under test output is compared against the golden model. So basically, you have a circuit simulating the golden model. <coughs> Sorry, you have a simulation simulating the golden model as well as the design under test. And you apply the test patterns. It could, it could be generated the way, the way we discussed earlier to both the design under test and the golden model. And you basically compare the outputs. And if the outputs are equal, that's great. Design under test is golden. Of course, this requires that your golden model to be completely verified to be correct, right? The challenge is uh, now, there are two challenges actually. One is golden model needs to be correct as we discussed. And also you still need to generate inputs to the designs. What do you do? Do you do sequential values to cover the entire input space? Do you test, do you do random values? How do you actually select your inputs to apply? And this is actually a fundamental problem. No question about that. Okay, let's take a look at the test bench code over here. It's now it becomes very simple. You have the silly function, inputs and output. You have the golden model. Inputs are the same as the silly function. Output is different. And you basically have a test pattern generation that applies uh, the inputs to both circuits. And then if y, uh, the output of the design under test is not equal to the output of the golden model, then you basically have an error at the negative edge of the clock, as you can see. OK, so now it's fully automated, right? Output checking is fully automated. You can even compare timing using a golden timing model if you're aggressive enough. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, it's highly scalable to as much simulation time as is feasible, at least a high coverage of the input space, but we're going to talk about input space in a little bit. Now you have better separation of roles. You can separate designers uh, that work on the design under test and designers that work on the golden model, right? And the testing engineer can focus on the important test cases instead of output checking. Now you can actually really partition the work and independent people can actually do independent designs plus the testing. Of course, the cons is creating a correct golden model may be difficult, too very difficult. Sometimes maybe, I'm not going to say impossible, but uh, not so easy uh, to uh, compare to the complexity of the original model. And coming up with good testing inputs can still be difficult. And that's true for all of the testing mechanisms, right? Regardless of the automatic, uh, how automatic they are, testing inputs are a critical problem. Okay, now let's talk about testing inputs. Even with automatic testing, how long would it take to test a 32-bit adder? So a 32-bit adder has 64 inputs because you're adding A and B. Each, uh, each of A and B has 32 bits, so you have 64 bits. That's two to the 64 possible inputs. If you test one input in one nanosecond, you can test 10 to the nine inputs per second, or this many inputs per day, or this many inputs per year. Basically, you need 58.5 years to test all possibilities, which means that exhausting testing, testing or brute force testing of every single possible input is not feasible. That's why you need to be smart. You need to prune the overall testing space. You cannot do exhaustive testing, even for a 32-bit adder, as you can see. Uh, so you need to do uh, some sort of pruning of the testing space, choosing important cases, eliminating as much as possible the cases that do not matter. Uh, basically, there's a lot of work that is dedicated to designing test cases. Or you could, you could do a, a combination of formal verification and testing, et cetera. I'm not going to go into the details, but this is one of the reasons why verification is a hard problem. In addition to everything we discussed, in the end, you're really limited by the length, the time to test. As a result, more than 70% 70, 70 of the design time of a cutting edge microprocessor is spent on testing. That's true for memory also. More than 70% of the time of memory, like DRAM, for example, is designed on verification and testing. Okay, let me quickly cover timing verification. We're not going to go into much detail on this and then we're going to conclude. Basically, there are multiple approaches to timing verification as well. You can do high-level simulation, like Verilog. You can model timing using the statements that we saw in the design under test, like the timing statements. You, it's useful for hierarchical modeling, clearly, to high-level simulation. You can insert delays in flip-flops, gates, memories, anything basically you want, including wires, actually, as we saw earlier. And high-level design will have some notion of timing in this case. But usually, it's not as accurate as real circuit timing, because you may say, OK, this flip-flop is going to take five nanoseconds clock to queue. But it may not, right? It may take much longer or shorter. So uh, the other approach that's more accurate is the circuit level timing verification. For this, you need to first synthesize your design to actual circuits. Basically, you have to go through high-level synthesis or whatever you do to actually create an actual level circuit uh, into your FPGA or ASIC, et cetera. Uh, 
or, or some low level design netlist, let's say. Uh, and there's no one general approach over here. It's very design flow specific. Your FPGA or ASIC technology uh, may have special tools for this. Usually they do. Like Vivado has some tools for this, assuming some backend uh, that you compile into. Uh, but of course, real industry level tools, industrial grade tools are actually very much sophisticated, especially for VLSI design, for example. If you're really interested in this, you may take a VLSI design class. We have very good VLSI design class at ETH, for example. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things that you can do over here, but it's very low level as you can see also. The good news is tools that you use will usually try to meet the timing for you. If you say, okay, I want this clock frequency. These are my setup times, hold times. Uh, and this is the expected clock skew or whatever. Uh, it will try to meet the timing, but unfortunately they may not always meet the timing. They usually provide some sort of timing report, timing summary. Uh, they give you worst case delay paths as much as they can discover them. Maximum operation frequency they expect. Any timing errors that, that were found, they may be conservative in these. Uh, these tools are not exhaustively exploring the space because exhaustively exploring space actually takes years as we saw. Uh, so they may give you some idea of your timing. Uh, and you may go back and fix your timing based on these tools, but you always need to be careful about how much you rely on the tools. And the bad news is the tool can fail to find a solution sometimes, so you're back to square one. Uh, desired clock frequency may be too aggressive. As a result, uh, you may have a setup time violation of a particular long path. The tool may be able to report that potentially. That's good. But still, it may not be able to find it. So you may actually go, need to go back and modify the circuit. You may have too much logic on clock paths, which may lead to uh, excessive clock skew. You may need to go back and fix your clock distribution paths. You may have timing issues with asynchronous logic, which we did not cover. So don't worry about it at this point. Basically, the tool will hopefully provide you helpful errors. That's the key expectation. Uh, with VR reports that will contain paths that fail to meet the timing. And it enables you to have a place from where you can start debugging. But unfortunately, as I said, these are not perfect. And don't rely on the perfectness of the tools as a designer. So you need to really know how your design well. And you need to really have a good understanding of timing if you really want to design a circuit that's really uh, very, very aggressive in terms of timing. And we didn't even talk about power, right? If we could even have a full lecture on power in a similar way, but I'm not going to do that clearly. OK, basically, you may need to fix your timing errors. And uh, to fix the timing errors, we already discussed this, actually. Usually, fixing the timing errors is a manual and iterative process, basically. You need to meet the, meet the strict timing constraints. And this could be tedious. You need to figure out where the problem is. The tool may point you to some direction that you need to go and fix what, that, what the problem in that direction is. You can later fix the problem, try synthesis and place on route with different options using the tool, different seeds. Because tool, again, it does a random exploration. Sometimes they could do, for example, Monte Carlo simulations, et cetera. Uh, uh, as a result, they don't fully explore the space. So you may actually try to also guide the tool to actually explore some different space than it has explored previously. But again, no guarantees here. You're at the mercy of the tool. If you don't, especially if you don't know what you're doing, you're at the mercy of the tool. OK, and then you can also manually provide hints, for example, to the tool. But now it becomes very, very tedious, right? And finally, you can, you, I think uh, you can manually optimize the reported problem paths. This is not a bad thing. You can simplify complicated logic, split up comp long combination logic paths. That's always a good thing in general. And, uh, but the difficulty is fixing whole time violations is difficult, as we discussed earlier. So meeting timing constraints is uh, essentially not, not an easy art and science in the end, because the tools are not perfect, and humans are not perfect. And there are many ways of actually designing a circuit, as I showed you. Even the 4 to 1 multiplexer, we saw three ways, for example, early on. And they all have different timings, as we discussed, right? OK, so let's go back to the fundamental principles over here. Clock cycle time is determined by the maximum logic delay we can accommodate without violating timing constraints. So hopefully that is clear. So good design principles help you in general. So in general, it's good to follow good logic design and architectural design principles. I'm going to talk about these, and I may actually introduce some later when we talk about microarchitecture. Uh, we're taking a little bit more time than expected, but that's OK. I think you can watch this lecture later on. And these are, as I already said, this is not going to be on the exam anyway, if, if, you're, if that's what you're worried about. But these good design principles are really important uh, for, uh, in general, I think, when you're doing any kind of design. Uh, so basically, one important design principle is critical path design. You really want to minimize the maximum logic delay as much as possible without wasting things. This maximizes performance. Right? And then you can decide, OK, whether I really want this or not. That's a separate issue. But critical path design is a good idea so that 
you maximize your performance as much as possible. Balanced design is another design principle. The, the idea here is to balance the maximum logic delays across different parts of a system. For example, different, between different pairs of flip-flops, you have this two flip-flops and you have some combination logic, and you have another set of two flip-flops and you have some combination logic. A balanced design balances the maximum logic delay across all of these different parts so that none of them is really a big critical path. And to be able to do that, you have no, uh, basically this, create, this ensures that there are no bottlenecks. And it also minimizes the wasted time in any path in general. So balanced design is actually good for efficiency as well as uh, not having bottlenecks in your system. And the last part is bread and butter design, uh, as, I, as we like calling it. And the idea is to optimize for the common case, but make sure that the non-common cases do not overwhelm the design. So uh, for example, if you have a common input that's going to be applied to your sequential circuit, maybe you should really optimize that path because if you know your circuit, for example, if you know that some input combination never happens for whatever reason, then you can say, oh, this, I'm, I'm going to guarantee that this input combination never happens. And you can eliminate that from the consideration of the timing, for example. And you can optimize your circuit with that in mind. And this may actually now maximize your performance for the realistic cases, right? And this is really the common case design. And you may handle the non-common case in some other way. This will become more clear when we talk about microarchitecture two weeks from now as well. But if you actually follow these good design principles, uh, you, this, these also help with meeting the timing constraints in a global level in your entire system, and also by minimizing your critical paths. OK, uh, we talked about a lot of interesting things, but hopefully uh, you learned a lot about timing. Uh, just to recap, we talked about timing in combinational circuits, sequential circuits, and circuit verification. The last part of the course was really about functional verification mostly. And we did talk about timing verification a little bit, but timing verification is really, uh, we didn't really go into as much detail in, in terms of the testing of the timings and verification. With that, I think we have now uh, covered uh, the timing lectures of, uh, over timing and verification lecture. And with this also, we have covered essentially the digital design uh, part of the course. Remember this course is really digital design and computer architecture. Uh, so it's a broad course that covers digital design and computer architecture, and we're done with the digital design part. Next week, we're going to start with the computer architecture part, which is really the instruction set architecture and von Neumann model. Uh, so, okay, there's a good question that I want to handle. I was going to ask for burning questions, but I saw one. So what if something breaks inside a chip breaks? Can those testing mechanisms be automized in, uh, automated in hardware so that the system finds them to prevent errors? Excellent question. So these are called self-checking circuits. And certainly it's possible. And there are multiple different ways of doing it. Uh, uh, and uh, existing microprocessors implement different forms of it in different parts of them. Uh, but yes, uh, what we have discussed can be also incorporated into the hardware design uh, uh, to, uh, to do the self-checking. In general, this is called self-checking circuits. Uh, but basically, for example, you may have an adder, right? Uh, and uh, that adder, uh, for whatever reason, produces a wrong output, right? Uh, instead of having a single adder, you may actually have two adders, right? That's, that's the simplest self-checking circuit. Of course, it's high overhead. But now you have two adders. You, do the, you apply the same inputs to both of the adders. And if one of them has an error, the other may not have an error, right? And at least if you have two adders, you know uh, that if their outputs disagree, there's something wrong, right? So this is a very simple example of a self-checking circuit. Instead of having a single component, have two components, and then check the outputs, apply the same inputs to them at the same time, or at different times. You could also apply the inputs at different times and then uh, fix things. So absolutely, existing circuits actually have that. They do it in different ways, of course. Uh, they do it in, 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 uh, in simpler ways, potentially. You may not necessarily have the adder, but you may actually uh, check, do a checksum, for example, right? Uh, you may, you may actually represent the inputs uh, as a smaller piece and basically uh, compute uh, uh, some checksum on the output and then basically ch check whether the checksum of the output of the adder is similar to the uh, checksum that you generate with a much simpler circuitry, right? Uh, and that, again, can give you an idea whether something has gone, gone wrong in your adder. Uh, uh, yeah, basically, I think one of your somebody else said, couldn't it work as well with an error correcting code like Hamming? Yes, I think the checksum is has a similar idea, basically. So basically, you represent uh, your inputs and outputs using some checksum or some code coding schemes, uh, 
uh, and essentially you uh, you have an adder that operates on the full thing, and you have an you have an imitation adder that operates on this code essentially, and you basically in the end check whether the code matches the output of the adder in some way when it's encoded, and if it doesn't match, then you know something is wrong. Uh, and uh, in, in safety critical systems, actually, people go into uh, lengths to actually have multiple different components. So you may actually have five adders, for example. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this is not, uh, this is not impossible. Uh, you may actually have five adders, and you basically uh, do majority voting in the output of the adders. Right? Five adders compute exactly the same things, and then the majority of the adders wins. If three of them give one output and two of them give some other output, the output that is uh, provided by three of them are, uh, is taken as the correct output. That may or may not be true, but the probability that it will be true is probably higher than the probability that the other output is true. OK, so I gave you the example of um, n modular redundancy. What I just said is really five modular redundancy. You uh, redundantly uh, instantiate multiple modules and check results across them. But there are simpler ways of doing it, like self-checking uh, adders uh, or, or checking using checksums and codes, et cetera. So basically, the testing principles can be incorporated into uh, the circuit itself. And usually, circuits that can do this kind of uh, testing uh, while they're running uh, are called self-checking. Uh, also, sometimes they're called online testing. You could do online testing of the circuitry to make sure that it's actually doing the thing that you intended to do uh, once in a while, potentially. right? You could actually do online testing of the delay path, for example, to make sure that nothing is wrong uh, after you manufacture the circuit. So all of the ideas that we discussed in terms of verification can be done online as well, while the circuit is running, uh, as opposed to offline. OK, uh, I'll wait for quick questions for, I guess, five more seconds or so. Otherwise, we will conclude. These are very good questions. OK, I think I don't hear anything. So let's conclude here. Uh, and what we're going to do, I think, is uh, next week, we're going to start with the von Neumann model and ISA. So until that time, have a good weekend. Uh, take care.